Hi, I'm Pastor Kerry. Hey, before we get started, there are a few things I want to encourage you to have on hand. First, I want to encourage you to have a set of the sermon notes. And if you don't already have them, you can go to the link that's right down below the video. It'll take you to a place where you can print a set of the sermon notes for yourself. I also want to encourage you to have some communion elements. You'll want to have some bread or a cracker. You'll want to have some juice or some wine. If you don't have juice or wine, really any beverage would suffice. But you'll want to have those communion elements because here in about 20 minutes, when we get to the end of the online sermon, we'll move right into a time of communion with you. So if you need any or all of those things, then I would encourage you to just pause the playback right now, get whatever you need. Once everything's ready, then go ahead and resume the playback. So I want to begin by saying right up front, I am by no means a musical expert. I am not. I'm not a musician, uh, but I do know a little bit about the way most modern songs are structured. And that modern structure that most songs have goes something like this. Most songs have a verse and then a chorus, and then maybe a second verse and the chorus again. And a lot of songs then will have what's called a bridge and then the chorus one more time, and voila, there's your song. Now, as you might imagine, there are a zillion variations on that, uh, but for the most part, that's kind of a rough overview of what a modern song looks like in terms of its structure. So the question is, has that always been the structure for songs? Well, obviously not. If you took a look in our hymnal, for example, you would find that one of the most classic hymns of all time is structured somewhat like that. If you looked up How Great Thou Art, you'd find that there are uh, verses and then a chorus that all of the verses share in common. So it's like verse 1, chorus, verse 2, chorus, verse 3, chorus, verse 4, chorus. So that's fairly similar. On the other hand, if you took a look at Amazing Grace, you would find that it's all verses, that there's no chorus, per se, to Amazing Grace. And, again, like I said, we could really go way off into the weeds with this if we wanted to. But the reason that I'm bringing up song structure today is because that idea of verse-chorus, like we have in most modern songs, like we have in the classic Christian hymn, How Great Thou Art, we can find examples of that even in the Old Testament. I promise you. We're going to take a look at it in the lectionary psalm for this coming Sunday for November 20th of 2022. The lectionary psalm is the 46th psalm, and we're going to go ahead and read it right now. The 46th psalm for the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. God lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A beautiful psalm, one of the classic psalms from the Old Testament. My guess is that this is a psalm with which you are probably familiar. So, first of all, let's do what we always do. Let's go ahead and talk through the psalm. Let's put a little bit finer point on some of the uh, particulars in the psalm. And then, after we talk through the psalm, we'll focus on four of the lessons that this psalm has for us. So, right there in the title line, we learn what I consider to be, I don't know about you, but what I consider to be several interesting things. Right there in the title line, we are getting some instructions to the director of music. We're told that this is a psalm by the sons of Korah. Maybe you've heard that term before, maybe you haven't, but the sons of Korah 
what, what do we know about them? Was Korah someone from the Old Testament? Well, yes, Korah was someone from the Old Testament. So Korah was one of the good guys in the Old Testament? Well, <laughs> no, not exactly. What we do know about Korah is that he ended up leading a rebellion, and he ended up being kind of a bad guy. But it appears that the descendants of Korah, and the assumption is that these weren't the immediate sons of Korah, but rather that these were several generations removed from Korah. These were the descendants, several generations uh, past Korah, but these were the quote-unquote sons of Korah. And maybe they're going to redeem the name of Korah by the work that they're doing. The sons of Korah uh, are attributed with about 11 of the Psalms. You know that David is attributed with a, a bunch of the Psalms. I think the number is 73. And I think that after David, the second most prolific author of Psalms uh, was someone named Asaph. Uh, Asaph is credited with 12 Psalms. And then after David and Asaph, then the sons of Korah come in next. They are credited with 11 of the Psalms. And if you're wondering, well, gosh, how many people wrote the Psalms? Well, after that, there are several individuals. Solomon is attributed as having written a couple of the Psalms. And then there are, I think, three more individuals that are attributed with one Psalm each. Moses, interestingly, is attributed as having written one of the Psalms. And then about 50 of the Psalms, we don't have any author to whom they are attributed. So anyway, let me try to come back in. I told you I wasn't going to get off in the weeds, but I'm, I'm getting off in the weeds, aren't I? So this is by the sons of Korah. It's attributed to the sons of Korah. And then it says, according to Alamoth. So who's Alamoth, you're probably wondering. And uh, is are we taking Alamoth's word for it that the sons of Korah wrote this? Well, actually, according to Alamoth is another musical instruction, kind of like for the director of music. In this case, according to Alamoth means that this was meant to be sung by a soprano. So, any of you out there a soprano? I hope that you were singing along as, as I was reading the psalm to you just a couple minutes ago. And then at the very end, of course, we're told that it was a song, but most Bible scholars believe that all of the psalms were songs. So... Anyway, let's jump into the psalm itself. Right there in verse 1, I know you've heard these words before. You've probably heard these words before. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. We're going to come back and we're going to talk more about that. But then the, the sons of Korah say, that's why we aren't going to fear, even though there's an earthquake happening all around us. Mountains falling into the heart of the sea. That doesn't sound good. And then it talks about how the waters are roaring and foaming, and the mountains are quaking with their surging. So we've got earthquakes, we've got tsunamis, crazy stuff that's happening all over the place. But God is our refuge and strength, even in the midst of all of this craziness. And if we're going to try to apply uh, a modern sense of song structure to this, I'd say that that was the first verse of this song, verses 1 through 3. So let's take a look now at the second verse of the song, verses 4 through 6. The psalmist talks about this river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells, and God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Break of day, the significance there is that thousands of years ago, when an army was going to attack a city, they would usually attack the city at daybreak. And so that is why God is going to help, is going to protect this holy city at daybreak, at the break of day. And then the sons of Korah go on to say that the nations are in uproar, the kingdoms are falling, but then when God's voice is heard, the earth and all of its troubles, all of its kingdoms, everything just melts away. So that's the second verse. And now we have the chorus. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now, let's jump into the third verse. We've already had the first verse in verses 1 through 3. We've had the second verse of this song in verses 4 through 6. Now let's have the third verse of the song in verses 8 through 10. The sons of Korah encourage us to come and see what God has done 
the desolations that have been brought on the earth, talks about how God has put an end to the wars and how God has broken the bow, shattered the spear, burned the shields. And then this third verse of the song takes a little bit of a turn. And after talking about how incredibly powerful God is, basically through all of the song up to this point, then in verse 10, the sons of Korah start speaking for God. And God says to us through the sons of Korah, be still and know that I'm God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. So we're going to come back and talk about that in just a minute. And then we have the chorus once again. The same chorus that we sang back in verse 7. Now we're singing it again in verse 11. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So we said that most modern songs go verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. This song appears to go verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. So, was this the advent of the modern song some three millennia ago? I doubt it. But it is kind of interesting to compare it, knowing that it was definitely a song and compare it to modern song structure. Let's do this now. Let's go ahead and let's focus on four of the lessons that this passage has for us. And the first lesson that it has is this. As people of faith, we don't need to be afraid because God is always with us. As people of faith, we don't need to be afraid because God is always with us. Look, all of the things that have been happening in the world over the past three years, even the things that have been happening in the world this past year, even when it seems like maybe this worldwide pandemic is finally calming down a little bit, there is still uh, an incredible war that's happening over in Ukraine. And that is certainly something for us to hope and to pray for the safety of those folks over in Ukraine, especially as it heads into winter. And even thinking about some of the natural disasters that we've experienced here in the United States recently, thinking about uh, the Hurricane Ian that moved through Florida, thinking about today as I'm recording this, New York State is just getting buried under feet and feet and feet of snow. It's good to be reminded that we don't need to be afraid because God is with us. And in this psalm, (laughs) this The sons of Korah talk about earthquakes and tsunamis and mountains falling into the heart of the sea and saying, it's okay. God is with us. We don't need to be afraid. And so a question for us to ask ourselves are, what are the things that tend to cause us fear? My guess is that the things that cause me fear might be different than the things that cause you fear. But whatever those things might be for both of us, we need to be reminded that God is is our refuge, a safe place for us to go, to take refuge and sanctuary away from these spheres. God is our strength. God's going to help us through these difficult moments. And so that is the first lesson. The second lesson we should take from the passage is this. As people of faith, we can trust that God will sustain and protect us. As people of faith, we can trust that God will sustain and protect us. You know, in the second verse of this psalm, it talks about a river with the streams that make glad the city of God. In other words, these streams are sustaining the city of God. And I don't know if you've ever really thought about this. This isn't something that I realized until a few years ago. And then when I read something that pointed it out, I was like, well, yeah, of course. Uh (laughs) Aha, I I should have been aware of that a long time ago. All of the settlements, all of the villages, all of the towns, all the cities, all the metropolises in the entire world, almost, almost all of them are built with a geographic feature in common. And do you know what that geographic feature is? All the settlements, all the cities, all the towns, the cities the metropolises, is it metropoli or metropolises? I don't don't know. But 
all of them have one geographic feature in common, and that is this. They're all built in proximity to water. Some of them are built next to a river. Some of them are built next to a lake. Many of them are built next to the ocean itself. I don't know if you realize this, but 14 of the 15 largest cities in the world, you know what they all have in common? They're built next to the ocean. 14 of the 15 largest cities in the world are built next to the ocean. Because water is something that we all need. Water sustains us. And in this passage, the sons of Korah are telling us that God is going to sustain us. And the thing that we need more than anything else other than God, the thing that we need is water. And God is going to sustain us much like these streams are sustaining the city of God. And also talking in this passage about how these nations are in uproar and the kingdoms are uh, raging, and yet God lifts God's voice and the earth melts away. All of these troubles, all of these issues, they all melt away. And so we can be confident that God is going to sustain and protect us. That is the second truth. The third truth the third lesson this passage has for us is this. As people of faith, we must remember that God's power will always be greater than human power. As people of faith, we must remember that God's power will always be greater than human power. And it's interesting to listen to the sons of Korah talk about the way war happened three millennia ago. They talk about bows and spears and shields. And we know that at that time, 3,000 years ago, they also used chariots. And there were other weapons that they had as well, but certainly nothing nearly as advanced as what we have today. When you think about the way that wars are fought today, they're fought with tanks, to be sure, but even tanks are getting kind of old-fashioned because wars today are fought with drones. And many times, you know, these, these drones don't even have humans anywhere remotely near them. So you've got drones, you've got missiles, you've got tanks, and yet God is greater than any of these things. Those, the, the weaponry that they had three millennia ago, the weaponry that we have today, God is greater than any of these things because God is the one who can bring peace. God is the one who can put an end to all of these conflicts. And it's good for us to remember that because sometimes I think all of us worry about what's happening in the world around us. God is greater. God's power is greater than any human power. That is the third lesson we should take away from this passage. The fourth lesson is this. As people of faith, we should have quiet moments in which we exalt God. As people of faith, we should have quiet moments in which we exalt God. And like I mentioned earlier, isn't it interesting that in this psalm, where the song, sons of Korah are talking over and over and over about the immense power of God over, uh, over Mother Nature, over uh, human power, then we get to the very end, and what's the final point that they make before the final chorus? The final point that they make at the end of the final verse, before the final chorus, is God speaking through them and saying to us, be still. Remember that I'm God and I'm going to be exalted. Everyone is supposed to exalt me. Everyone in all the nations, everyone in all the earth. Be still. Remember that I'm God and allow me to be exalted. Assumedly, through you, through me, through us. And so my hope is that all of us will take that as a reminder that in our busy lives where we've got noise going constantly, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, I'm as guilty as anybody. I always have something playing, whether it is music, whether it is the TV, whether it is a podcast, whether I'm listening to an audio book, whatever. <laughs> I mean, there is always noise in my life, always. And so I'm one 
who probably needs to take uh, close, pay close attention to these words, and I'm one who needs to say, when do I choose to be still and exalt God? So, folks, I'm going to take that as my homework from this passage. I might encourage you, if you're like me and you've always got noise in your life, if you never have a time of private worship, then I would encourage you to take that as your homework as well. Figure out a time when you can be still and when you can exalt God in a quiet moment of worship. Well, friends, that's where we're going to leave off today. But right now, what I'd like to do is I'd like for us to go ahead and take a look at Jesus' words as recorded by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, I would encourage you to go ahead and grab your communion elements right now, and I'll go ahead and grab mine. Now, I would invite you to partake of your bread with me. The body of Christ, broken for us, we partake in remembrance of him. And the blood of Christ, shed for us, we drink in remembrance of him. Let us pray. God, you are indeed our refuge. You are indeed our strength. You are our help in times of trouble. And God, you know that many of us have been experiencing a lot of troubles over the past several years. And for many of us, myself included, the troubles that we've experienced don't even begin to compare to the troubles that others have experienced. So God, help all of us to turn to you, allow you to be our refuge and strength. And God, we pray that you would help us also, even in the midst of the turmoil in the world around us, help us to look for the quiet moments with you when we can worship you and exalt you. God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, that's where we're going to leave off today. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week.